I, George C. Stevens, Lieutenant Colonel, Army of the United States, hereby certify that, on 1 March 1945 to 8 May 1945, I was on active duty with the United States Army Signal Corps, attached to Supreme Headquarters Allied Expeditionary Forces, and among my official duties was the direction of the thing of Nazi concentration and prison camps as liberated by Allied forces. The motion pictures which will be shown following this affidavit were taken by official Allied photographic teams in the course of their military duties, each team being composed of military personnel under the direction of a commissioned officer. To the best of my knowledge and belief, these motion pictures constitute a true representation of the individuals and scenes photographed. They have not been altered in any respect since the exposures were made. The accompanying narration is a true statement of the facts and circumstances under which these pictures were made. George C. Stevens, Lieutenant Colonel, AUS, sworn to before me the second day of October, 1945, James B. Donovan, Commander, United States Naval Reserve. I. E. R. Kellogg, Lieutenant, United States Navy, hereby certify that from 1929 to 1941, I was employed at 20th Century Fox Studios in Hollywood, California, as a director of photographic effects, and am familiar with all photographic techniques. I have been on active duty with the United States Navy. I have carefully examined the motion picture film to be shown following this affidavit and I certify that images of these excerpts from the original negative have not been retouched, distorted, or otherwise altered in any respect, and are true copies of the originals held in the vaults of the United States Army Signal Corps. These excerpts comprise 6,000 feet of film selected from 80,000 feet, all of which I have reviewed, and all of which is similar in character to these excerpts. E. R. Kellogg, Lieutenant, United States Navy, sworn to before me this 27th day of August, 1945, John Ford, Captain, United States Navy. These are the locations of the largest concentration and prison camps maintained throughout Germany and occupied Europe under the Nazi regime. This film report, covering a representative group of such camps, illustrates the general conditions which prevailed. More than 200 political prisoners were burned to death at this concentration camp near Leipzig. Others, among the original total of 350 inmates, were shot down by German elite guards as they dashed from the prison huts to celebrate the arrival of American troops outside the city. The atrocity story is told by the few who managed to survive. They relate how 12 SS troopers and a Gestapo agent lured 220 starving prisoners into a big wooden building at this camp, sprayed the structure with an inflammable liquid, and then applied the torch. Machine guns set up at various vantage points mowed down many victims who ran from the burning building. Some miraculously escaped the hail of bullets, but were electrocuted by the live wires of a fence, which was the final hurdle for those fleeing the flames. The Leipzig victims were Russians, Czechs, Poles, and French. The dead are viewed by Russian women liberated from slave labor. At Panig, Germany, a concentration camp was overrun by the 6th Armored Division containing mainly Hungarians, who were people of wealth and esteem in their native country. Among them were young girls of only 16 years of age. The women show the scars of miserable existence under Nazi prison rule. American doctors examine the victims. Some have gangrenous wounds.
Others suffer from fever, tuberculosis, typhus, and additional communicable diseases. All existed under appalling conditions in vermin-infested quarters and with little or nothing to eat. As soon as our troops arrived, arrangements were made to remove these people from the miserable surroundings. Under supervision of the American Red Cross, the stricken inmates are removed to a hospital which belonged to the German Air Force. Nazis who formerly maltreated them are forced to help look after the patients. The staff of German nurses is also forced to attend the victims. The women are able to smile for the first time in years. At this concentration camp in the Gotha area, the Germans starved, clubbed, and burned to death more than 4,000 political prisoners over a period of eight months. A few captives survived by hiding in the woods. The camp is chosen for a high command inspection led by General Dwight D. Eisenhower. Also present are Generals Omar N. Bradley and George S. Patton. The 4th Armored Division of General Patton's 3rd Army liberated this camp early in April. The generals view the rack that was used by the Nazis to whip the inmates. They see the woodshed where lime-covered bodies are stacked in layers and the stench is overpowering. Former inmates demonstrate how they were tortured by the Nazis. American congressmen invited to view the atrocities were told by General Eisenhower, nothing is covered up. We have nothing to conceal. The barbarous treatment these people received in the German concentration camps is almost unbelievable. I want you to see for yourselves and be the spokesman for the United States. The general and his party next see the crude woodland crematory, actually a grill made of railway tracks. Here, the bodies of victims were cremated. Charred remains of several inmates still lay heaped atop the grill. Another group to visit the Ordruf camp is composed of local townspeople, including prominent Nazi party members. They'll be taken on a forced tour of the campsite by Colonel Haydn Sears, commander of the 4th Armored Division's Combat Command A, which captured Ordruf. A 
German medical major is compelled to accompany the townspeople. Colonel Sears stands by as the Nazis are informed that they must see all the horrors at the camp. First, the visitors view some 30 freshly killed bodies lying in the courtyard of the camp where they'd been shot on the evening preceding the entry of American tanks. These two are identified as slave labor bosses who maltreated, tortured, and killed their workers. Next, to the woodshed, which the Nazis are reluctant to enter, but Colonel Sears demands that they get a close-up look at the most gruesome of sights. The labor bosses enter. According to reports, the local Nazis continued their tour of the camp without apparent emotion. All denied knowledge of what had taken place at Ordruf. They are taken to the crematory two miles outside the camp where the list of the atrocities is read for all to hear. The 4,000 Ordruf victims are said to include Poles, Czechs, Russians, Belgians, Frenchmen, German Jews, and German political prisoners. The day before these Nazis visited the camp, the Burgermeister of Ordruf was forced to view the horrors. He and his wife were later found dead in their home, apparently suicides. American officers arrive at a Nazi institution seized by First Army troops. Under the guise of an insane asylum, this has been the headquarters for the systematic murder of 35,000 Poles, Russians, and Germans sent here mainly for political and religious considerations. Those still alive are examined by Major Hermann Bolker of the American War Crimes Investigation Team. The townspeople in Hadamar, Germany, called this place the House of Shudders. Meanwhile, at the graveyard attached to the institution, bodies are exhumed for autopsy. 20,000 are buried here. 15,000 who died in a lethal gas chamber were cremated and their ashes interred.
death books found hidden in the wine cellar of the Hadamar Institution revealed part of the story of the mass killings. The bulky volumes contained thousands of death certificates. Profession unknown, nationality unknown, was written after each name. The corpses are lined up pending the arrival of WCIT officers. Major Bolker performs the autopsy. A detailed listing is made of all clinical data. interrogating the institution heads. Dr. Wallmann, the taller man, was the top Nazi in charge of the place. The other man entering the room is Carl Willig, chief male nurse. He admits to killing inmates with overdoses of morphine. The testimony of other witnesses substantiated the fact that morphine was issued at the institution without attempt at making a record. As many as 17 at a time died from the morphine injections. The investigating officers were told that the Nazis never bothered to determine whether a victim may have survived the overdosing. Instead, all were hustled off to the graveyard and buried in piles of 20 to 24. The prisoners are removed to await trial. A Hadamar judge told the investigators that when the 10,000th victim died, the institution heads and Nazi officials staged a celebration. This is Breendonk prison in Belgium. It offers evidence of Nazi brutality imposed on Belgian patriots during the period of German occupation. Many of the horror exhibits remain untouched, such as the blood-stained coffins. Demonstrating how the victims were tied up for administering vicious beatings. A barbed wire stick was used on the backs of the men. Another method for rendering a patriot helpless while he was attacked by his Gestapo guards. The Nazis also would tie a man in chains in this manner and then apply the tourniquet. Berlin made thumb screw and how it was used. A victim shows scars caused by repeated beatings. Others show what happened to them as results of both beatings and cigarette burns. A Belgian demonstrates the manner in which his crutch was split by the Nazis. A woman discloses the results of a beating.
the slave labor camp at Nordhausen, liberated by the 3rd Armored Division, 1st Army. At least 3,000 political prisoners died here at the brutal hands of SS troops and pardoned German criminals who were the camp guards. Nordhausen had been a depository for slaves found unfit for work in the underground V-bomb plants and in other German camps and factories. Amid the corpses are human skeletons too weak to move. Men of our medical battalions work two days and nights binding wounds and giving medications. But for advanced cases of starvation and tuberculosis, there were often no cures. The survivors are shown being evacuated for treatment in Allied hospitals. The victims are mainly Poles and Russians, with considerable numbers of French and other nationalities also included in the camp roster. Bürgermeister of Nordhausen is ordered to provide 600 German male civilians who will inter the 2,500 unburied bodies at the camp. A priest administers last rites for the dead while the corpses are being carried to the hillside for burial. Then the actual burial in common graves of the 2,500 Nordhausen victims. The Harlan concentration camp near Hanover. Out of 10,000 Polish men brought here 10 months prior to April 1945, only 200 remained. Prisoners who could walk were removed before American troops entered Hanover. The others were left to starve and die. Immediate relief was provided for the men with the arrival of a Red Cross club mobile. The men broke into tears when they were given hot soup, other food, and cigarettes and clothing. When questioned, most of these men could not remember when they'd last eaten a decent meal. Many had been beaten and tortured so long their minds had failed. Some of the inmates are too weak to leave their bunks or even eat. Others bunk together to keep their frail bodies warm. The deaths continue even after liberation of the camp. Some were too far gone when the Americans took over.
An AMG sergeant checks the list of inmates. The victims relate the atrocity story and photographs are made for further documentation of the horrors committed at the Hanover camp. This concentration camp was overrun by American troops in April. The prisoners were mainly Poles and Russians. Maltreated and starved, 1,700 were housed in tents which contained only 100 bunks. While our forces were nearing Arnstadt, the Nazis removed most of the captives. They shot those who were too weak to get away fast enough. Savage watchdogs were used to help guard the camp. German civilians are forced to dig up the bodies. This is the second burial ground for the victims. The spot where they were originally buried after the massacre was apparently too close to the town. The Arnstadt villagers could not tolerate the stench of the dead, and they themselves moved the bodies to this site. Now they again must exhume the corpses, this time under armed persuasion. Victims bear the marks of violent deaths. American troops view the evidence of Nazi barbarism. 1,200 civilians walk from the neighboring city of Weimar to begin a forced tour of the camp. There are many smiling faces, and according to observers, at first the Germans act as though this was something being staged for their benefit. One of the first things that the German civilians see as they reach the interior of the camp is the parchment display. On a table for all to gaze upon is a lampshade made of human skin, made at the request of an SS officer's wife. Large pieces of skin have been used for painting pictures, many of an obscene nature. There are two heads which have been shrunk to one-fifth their normal size. These and other exhibits of Nazi origin are shown to the townspeople. The camera records the changes in facial expressions as the Weimar citizens leave the parchment display. The tour continues with a forced inspection of the camp's living quarters, where the stench, filth, and misery defied description. They see the result of lack of care in the bad case of trench foot. Other evidences of horror, brutality, and human indecency are shown, and these people are compelled to see what their own government had perpetrated. Correspondents assigned to the Buchenwald story have given wide notice to the well-fed, well-dressed appearance of the German civilian population of the Weimar area. 